Hey, good evening, New Hope. I hope that you just enjoyed that video. I know I sure laughed a lot this morning. If you were at church, you got to see that Father's Day video in part two tonight. I know I enjoyed it and had a good laugh. Uh, just going off the theme of uh, just Father's Day tonight, I just wanted to talk about uh, adoption. And I think adoption is a theme that we primarily see in the New Testament and uh I think it's something that we're pretty familiar with in today's uh, society, and we know what it looks like in today's society. Um, but when Paul uses the word in uh, the book of Romans, and also as we see in Galatians, um, he alludes to it. Uh, he's very intentional with the word adoption. And uh, before we dive into our text today uh, in Romans, Galatians, and Ephesians, um, I, I want to kind of give you a, a back history of adoption in the Old Testament. Very rarely is adoption mentioned in the Old Testament. I could only find it three places that were even implied. Uh, in fact, the Hebrew possesses no technical term for the practice, and it makes no appearance in the Old Testament um, in any of the laws. And the three places in the Old Testament I could find uh, adoption just being implied was one when Pharaoh's daughter uh, adopted Moses in Exodus 2.10 after he had been nursed and raised a little older, the Hebrew says, and he became her son. Uh, the second instance was when another Pharaoh adopted Ginnubath in 1 Kings 11, and neither of these instances were the word adoption or adopted used. And the third instance is in the book of Esther, and it's briefly mentioned that Mordecai had taken Esther in uh, as his daughter. And they were living in a foreign culture. And in the Old Testament, it's not a common practice to be adopted whatsoever. And, and we also see that in the first two instances that uh, we see in the Old Testament, they are from foreign cultures. Uh, so we know that adoption was not a regular occurrence in the, the Old Testament, we, we know that uh, um, adoption was only implied. It, they didn't even use the word in the Old Testament. And three, the examples and stories of adoption were all based in foreign countries and in foreign cultures and traditions. Um, this was not a practice that the Jews uh, were, were in the habit of making. And so now that we know this, we can read this text in the New Testament with a little bit more light where Paul is really bringing some intentionality with his wordage. I'll be reading from several texts, but as I said earlier, Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, you can go ahead and flip to Romans chapter 8. I'm going to be reading verse 12 uh, through 17. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live by the Spirit, you will put to death the misdeeds of the body and you will live for those who are already led by the spirit of god are children of god the spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again rather the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship there it is and by him we cry abba father the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are god's children now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Notice how God calls us his children and his sons. And, and with that calling, we become joint, joint heirs with Christ. Verse 15 says that we received the spirit of sonship. And they translated this passage this way to try to help us understand what adoption truly means. And I'll refer back to this passage in a little bit, but let's take a look at another passage that Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 3, and we're going to be reading into uh, chapter 4. So 3, starting in verse 26, Paul says this, So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor male or female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abram's seed and heirs according to the promise. In chapter 4, verse 1, what I am saying is that as long as an heir is underage, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time is set by his father. So also, when we were underage, we were in slavery under the uh, 
elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also his heir. Before we go any further, I just want to pray. I forgot to do that, um, but it's not too late. So God, I just pray tonight that as we hear your word, as we dive into your scripture, we look at what it means to be adopted and have sonship and, and be called a son or daughter of Christ. I just pray that we would um, be able to walk in that confidently, that you would reveal things to us that uh, we need to be reminded of so that we can live a life that's confident in, what you've, in who you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. So once again here in Galatians, uh, in verse 5, Paul uses the word adoption. It is clear by these passages and other passages in the New Testament that we are children of God. In 1 John 1, verses 12 and 13, it says, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or husband's will, but born of God. In 1 John, it talks about being children of God. Several places in Scripture, other than Paul's writings, makes it clear that God is making mankind his children. So we have to read these two passages, and, and after reading these, we have come to the conclusion that we have the opportunity to be adopted into God's family. That gets me fired up. That gets me excited. And uh, we all know what adoption looks like in today's world. But let's take a look at what adoption looked like and meant in the time that this book was written. Remember that that both Jews and Gentiles would be reading um, this book. It's ju both Jews and Gentiles were the intended audience um, for Paul. So when we read these passages, it's important that we have the understanding that um, adoption wasn't something necessarily that the Jews were familiar with. Um, so when someone was adopted in the New Testament and during Bible times, a legal transaction took place. And it was a two-step transaction of a legal transaction. The first was the release from the natural father's authority. And, and so if I were to adopt someone, I would have to have someone say, I am no longer their father. I am no longer um, responsible for them. There's a release of authority from the natural father. And the second is that the adopting's father is claiming authority over the adoptee. Now, this is uh, pretty simple. There's uh, not too different um, in today's uh, society. Oftentimes, you have to, to give up your parental rights if you're going to have adoption or in, in sad cases sometimes they are revoked or stripped from an individual and then there's an adoption that takes place but for the adoptee in legal terms this is where it's very interesting this was a new birth for the adoptee a new life had begun the old life has was gone all rights in the old family were gone all rights in the new family were now his the adopted son was heir to his adoptive father's estate. If there were other sons or other children in the household, this adoptee would be an equal right. This wouldn't be like, oh, you get a quarter and they get three quarters. It would be halves and half, um, a full heir to the adoptive's uh, father. Debts of his old life were canceled and no claim could be made against him in the courts. Of, of law on that account. And in the eyes of the law, there is no longer a person that he has been. He's completely a new man. And uh, what a powerful just image and significant word that Paul's using. And I believe that he's intentionally using this because he knew the audience that he was writing to. And as God's adopted children, we get to step into a new future. Our past is completely gone. There is nothing that Satan can bring up that we have done that he can accuse us. But we get to walk forward now with the name of Christ on the back of our jerseys. And we are free and forgiven. And in the eyes of God, our Father, we praise the Lord get to walk as a free man, as a free woman. 
And as God's adopted children, we, re we also receive the rights and the responsibilities as heirs. In Romans 8, 17, as we read, we, we share in his sufferings. Okay, God never promised that when you call on his name and you are saved, that life would be easy. But, but he says, in this world, you will have problems. You will suffer. You will have trials and tribulation. But behold, he is with us. And so we share in Christ's sufferings, but also we uh, inherit his glory, or in other words, his resurrection. We not just inherit the, the sufferings, we inherit the right and the promise of eternal life. We have the promise of heaven and spending eternity with God, and, and that is the part that makes it worth it all. I think of that old chorus that many of you know, it will be worth it all. When we see Jesus, life's trials will seem so small. When we see Christ, right? I'm so thankful that we don't just share in the sufferings, but we also share in the victory and the glory of the resurrection. But not only are we adopted when Jesus Christ and God our Father saves us, not only is the one that God is doing the adopting, but we need to, as Christians, respond in an, in an adoptive heart and manner. We have to adopt God as our Father. He is our Heavenly Father, and He cares for us so much more than any earthly father could ever care for us. And His promises and blessings are beyond comprehension. We have adopted this amazing Father. But when we call God our Father, that means we are adopting His way of life. It's it's when you step into sonship or or being a daughter of God, we are saying I'm stepping into the family of God and now your rules, your regulations, the way that you want me to live my life, I'm going to submit under those because you have adopted me. It, it's it's new house rules. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5 if you've still got your Bibles. And in Ephesians 4, it talks about putting off the old and putting on the new. And, and, and once we have been called God's children, this is what we're supposed to do. We have a renewed spirit and a renewed mind. And we're to live as children of light. So let's read Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 1. We'll go through 11. Paul says this, Follow God's example, therefore, is dearly loved children and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people, nor should there be obscenity, uh, foolish talk or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this, you can be sure no immoral, impure or greedy person such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore do not be partners with them. For once you were in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, and find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. See, Paul instructs us to follow God's example. Now, as a dad myself, I, I, uh, I now am having a little guy come around and want to mimic me in everything that he does. He wants to wear jeans and t-shirt because jeans and t-shirts are my favorite clothes to wear. He he wants to wear a Yankees hat because a Yankees hat's my favorite hat to wear. He wants to do everything that dad wants to do and he's imitating me and he's watching me carefully. I think of this song um, that uh, a country artist saying one time and it says, Dad, I've been watching you. Hey, ain't that cool? I'm your buckaroo. I want to be like you. And eat all my food and grow as tall as you are. We got cowboy boots and camo pants. Yeah, we're just alike. Hey, ain't we bad? I want to do everything you do. So I've been watching you. I want to ask you tonight, 
Have you been watching your heavenly father close so that you can mimic him, so that you can become like Christ, so that you can become and reflect God our Father, I hope that you have. And, and just as I look a lot like my dad and Sam will someday look a lot like me, hopefully prettier, um, but but in personality and in traits and in habits and in the way we speak and treat other people, we need to be people that reflect our Heavenly Father. God our Father is not the only person that we need to adopt. I think one other area of adoption that we have to adapt to, um, and I think the church hasn't done the best job always at this, is we need to adopt new believers immediately into the family of God. I think oftentimes when someone is saved, we kind of say, oh, we'll see how long that lasts. We'll see how long it lasts before they go back to the bars or before they go back to the bottle or before they do this or that. And we put new believers in this this time of of a proving process in this testing period, are they going to be perfect? Of course not. Sanctification is a process. Many of you are saved from deep, dark things. Can you think back and remember to your life before you had Christ in it? And in the moment that you had Christ, some of you are set miraculous, miraculously free, but most of us are going through the process of being made holy, which is sanctification. We, as a church, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to adopt one another and ask God to open up our eyes that we might see a new convert the way that God sees them. Yes, they are going to have an adjustment period where they are struggling and, and maybe learning all of God's rules and the house rules that need to take place. But we have to have patience and love them through that and help them and not root against them, not talk behind their backs, not do anything else. We adopt God as our father, but we also adopt our brothers and sisters in Christ. Ask yourself, are you judgmental? Are, are, are you allowing... Um, just different doubts to come in and prevent you from really loving your brothers and sisters in Christ. God has adopted us and he has set us free from our past, from any debts. He's given us a future, an heir to an everlasting life. And since we are adopted, we need to imitate God and we need to turn our attention towards him. He has called us, he has called us his children and we get to call him our Father, and we need to adopt the family traits of Christ, of being forgiving, of being loving, of being um, patient. We need to die to ourselves. We need to be a servant and, and, and giving, becoming like our Heavenly Father, as I said, is a process. It takes time, but as we focus and we spend time with Him, we will eventually become like He is. As much as my dad loves me, and as much as I love my son, and as much as any earthly father could love a son or a daughter, and I love my daughters too, um, I just want to bring it back that God loves us way more than we could ever love anyone else here on earth. His promise of the future is worth it all, and he loves us so incredibly much and even though things on earth right now might not seem the best for you, his promise of the future glory is worth it. And so I leave you with these three things. First, I hope that this message encouraged you knowing that God is inviting you to the eternal family of God and he loves you. He wants to be with you. And I hope that encourages you. I hope that as we sing songs um, like uh, uh, who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I hope that that gets into your heart and you actually walk as a child of God, as an image bearer of God, and that you would walk knowing that God loves you and you'd be confident in that and you wouldn't be ashamed to be in his presence, but you would come running to his arms. And so my prayer is that as God has given us a new life and a promise of new life and the old is gone and the new has come, that that would encourage you. And, and the second thing I want to leave you with is, is a, a question is how many of you would say, man, I need to spend more time with my heavenly father. I need to spend more time uh, absorbing who he is through the word of God, through Jesus Christ and observing the way he is 
he lived his life and spending more time in prayer. We need to be people that reflect our fathers. And third, maybe you're you're watching tonight and, and you've never joined the family of God. If that's you, would you just simply repeat this prayer after me and make it your own? And then I want you to send me an email at Austin dot. Uh, Austin at newhope.church and uh, let me know that you made that decision. But Jesus, I pray that you would come into my heart, that you would fill my heart with your love. Forgive me of your sins, of my sins, and set my feet on a path of righteousness. Help me be like you. Help me love you. And I'm sorry for what I've done, but I'm stepping into the sonship or the daughtership of God. And I thank you for your promises. And I love you with my whole life. And I'll reflect and do everything as you say, as you strengthen me and empower me to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm glad that you were with us tonight. I hope that all the dads out there had a great day. I ate two fillets um, and I had some gummy bears and some mac and cheese. So uh, today was a great day for me and I'm praying that it is for you too. And God bless you. I look forward to seeing you all at church. If you haven't made it back, um, we're having a ball and uh, happy Father's Day. We'll talk to you later.